And it's such a pleasure to, to be able to talk to you about the show. Uh, and like a lot of people in this audience, I suspect I've been binge watching it in preparation for, the, for this final stretch. And uh, it might be a little more acute, uh, this feeling of deja vu in my case, but uh, there's a number of things that I, 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 I'll watch the show and realize, oh, I should have mentioned that in my review. How could <laughs> I have missed that? It's and, very dense. I, you know, my kids still have not all watched the show despite the fact that it put a roof over their house, over their head. <laughs> over their head. Um, and uh, my, my son is a, one of my sons is a real film person. He's 14 and I said, you know, and he's ripping through The Sopranos right now, which is very exciting yeah. and really fun to watch again. But I was like, you could watch the show, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, Dad, it's so hard. Every one of them's like five movies. <laughs> and I consider that a compliment, but it is pretty dense. And it's one of my criticisms of criticism uh, a lot of times because of the recap culture that you can't write about it while you're watching it. Yeah. And you know, to see something more than one time, it really sort of reveals itself to you. And you can you know, tweet OMG or whatever, or WTF, and yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's great. But the whole idea that you're gonna have any experience, especially in the nonverbal moments, because that's when you stop to type. Yes. Um, and that's when all the meat's hitting. You know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it, it's a tough thing. But I, th I think you've done okay. I try. I, I try to. Uh, I try to watch every episode twice before I write a recap, uh, if I can. Because, That's helpful. Because if whether you write, whether you put your head down and write, or you pause it and right. then and then write, you're still missing something. You're missing. If you're not missing an image or a line of dialogue, you're missing. You're you're interrupting the rhythm of the show. That's so. that's true. That's basically how I would want you to watch it. Oh, well, good. <laughs> you, you have, when you Not write... Not that I have control over that, but I really would like it. <laughs> when you, so you read these recaps, you read the pieces... I do occasionally, I go in and out of reading them, because it's, it's disturbing to me, because, the, uh, not yours in particular, but they are grossly inaccurate. I feel like the nation needs a, needs a, um, a lesson in, in book reports again. <laughs> and they just sort of like, you know, it's one thing to, uh, it's, I, I hate seeing obviously, and I see these things asserted about what they mean, and it's sort of like, you can describe what happened, that's one kind of recap, I don't know how useful that is. Right. Um, but not, not useful now, I don't think. Well, I don't know. I mean, in the end, I love that there's a conversation about it, and I love that whatever is actually going on, that people feel compelled to talk about it and to, re I think it's a chance to relive it in some way and see what the experience was. Did I have the same experience? I mean, there's a very famous uh, um, experimental film called Wavelength that I had to see in film school. It's an avant-garde film. And in it, you are watching a solid zoom for 40 minutes. Yeah. And you're watching the scene and there's a, a, an event in it. It's a, it's a very interesting film, you know the film. But at a certain point, you just start paying attention to this chair, this yellow chair. And I remember afterwards having a conversation, 40 minutes, it's a really a meditative, ruminative experience. And people start talking about the yellow chair and just the idea that we were all thinking about it at the same time, that is like an incredible experience. And that, I think, is a, a big part of the recap culture. I like that. It is, it is. It's also good as a snapshot of how people were feeling at mm -hmm. the moment that this show, an episode, a particular show, especially a show that for whatever reason is meaningful, <coughs> appeared for the first time. Because what you're getting, it's almost like an EKG reading oh, or something at the audience's response. And especially if you're on Twitter, because when you know somebody, something really, really dramatic happens, somebody dies you didn't think was gonna die, somebody gets divorced you didn't right, think was gonna be divorced, right. it's like this eruption. It's like That's this true. eruption of emotion, oh my God. Or finally, something happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In that case. I always say it's, it's about how it happens. It's not about what happens. I mean, that's why I'm so spoiler phobic in a way, too, is like there's the, the actual events can be summed up sometimes of a season in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a paragraph or two. I just have to say, your, the notes that you enclose, <laughs> when they, they send out, usually it's only the first episode of the season because they don't, you know, they don't want to spoil us. They don't want to spoil us because we might give out spoilers. But uh, they'll There's send only out... seven this time. I That's like, well, true. I'm give out a third of the season. But there will usually be a note that will say, Matthew Weiner re respectfully requests that you not reveal the following information. And it is always the damnedest list. <laughs> I have to say, it's never the things that I would think would be on there. Like something will, be, something will happen, I'll watch it, and it's like, he didn't want us to mention that that person died violently, but it's like, please don't reveal the color of Roger's tie. 
or something. Like it's always like I never understand. It's why. always first person, and it's always the same stuff. And <laughs> what year it takes place in? Yeah, is I mean the them. things that people are asking about in between the season. Yeah. That's what I don't want the, that answered. I want them to have the and I and I always say it. I always write it first person. I always say, please let the audience have the same experience you had, mm -hmm. which is they don't know anything. Yeah. And I don't think there's you know it's a commercial consideration. There's not that much in the world that you don't know what's going to happen. Certainly in entertainment, everything is sort of you know <laughs> here's the trailer with all the details, and we just try you know our trailers are obviously notoriously <laughs> yes. obtuse. <laughs> yes. Don, come in here. Close the door. What? Yes. You don't say. <laughs> yeah. We have great promo people. That is yeah, my fault. It is. Well, and actually, it's a continuation of, of I, I remember, it's even more refined and extreme version of uh, the, the, the promos the next week on Mad Men. You used to do those same things. And all the log lines, I've noticed that the shows that are very, very, uh, very much about withholding and then revealing surprises of one kind or another, when you look at the log lines on, on the grid, it always says, uh, Tony discusses a business deal, <laughs> yeah. or something like that. Like it's always we, we did it. I just want to do it every time Don has a problem. <laughs> yes. Or a client the makes things difficult. For yeah, them. yeah, an old friend looks up somebody. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but speaking of speaking of the details that you that you cling to that you choose to withhold or or to reveal, um, and also uh, what you care about when you're writing a show. When you read these recaps, when you read any kind of criticism of the show, especially one that is as dense and elusive as Mad Men, you <laughs> see, well, clearly this is a metaphor for that, or this is foreshadowing this, or this is a callback to this other thing, and I always wonder how much of this is really in the grand design, how much of it is flying by the seat of your pants, and is there, have there, are there moments where you look at an episode that you've done in a more recent season and say, oh my God, uh, we did that, we, maybe we kid, did kind of do that on purpose, even though they weren't thinking about it. Well, um, there's lots of things that you do on purpose. I'm a believer in the fact that, as with actors, uh, writers are the same, that if it's on your mind, it's gonna be in the show. That's how theme comes out. You don't start to write a thing about man's inhumanity to man. You start writing a story about somebody who, who lost their dog and no one will help them find it, and what's on your mind is man's inhumanity to man, and if you're lucky when you get to the end of it, that's what will be there. Mm -hmm. And the, the stories are that specific, and they're done one at a time. Now the difference is on a show like this, like The Sopranos, because I only know because I was there at the end when there was a lot of references, yeah. when a character came along and, and they're like, why don't we name him Feech Lamana? You know, because Feech Lamana got mentioned to Terry Winter, Encyclopedic Knowledge of Everything, got mentioned season two. Remember Feech Lamana, he was made before the electric light. <laughs> And um, uh, you know, you start sort of paying those things off retroactively, and it looks like it was planned. But the interesting thing to me is we're doing each episode to tell a story, individual stories, thematic stories that are related to each other, and group stories and total stories. And when you get to something like, let's say, um, the Grown Ups, which is known to be as the JFK episode, and you're like. The society has visited this so many times. I don't feel like doing it. I'm not just doing it so that people can run in and say, the president's been shot. Yeah. I don't want that drama. Right. But you start thinking like, what was it like for my characters? They're real people now. Am I just gonna skip that? I can skip it if I want to. But you're kind of thinking, they, what, what, what will it do to change their lives? What is actually being changed in their lives? And, striking upon the idea that this was a, especially when I saw the timeline that had not really been exploited, that the, the assassination happened on a Friday and then people are watching TV. The news spreads faster than any event in the history of, in American history. Right. With the radio, they said Lincoln's death that took like, I think 72 hours for most of the country to know, which was pretty fast. There was a telegraph, yeah. there were trains. This was within an hour and a half. They think 90% of the population knew because of the radio. And so people start watching TV, people who have not watched TV before, and the average American is watching something like 20 hours of TV that weekend. That means that there are a bunch of people who are watching all of it. And there are really only, only three, three networks. There's nothing going on. There's a, yeah. there's a camera stationed on Arlington Cemetery for like four and a half hours with David yeah. Brinkley vamping. And people needed it. And yeah. the TV, the, the rising role of the TV in our life is a big part of the show, you know? And, and, and I wanted to show that. I wanted to show the phones going out. I wanted to show... The, 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 uh, the, the interruption of the soap opera and everything. And then when Betty Draper sees um, Oswald get shot, a lot of people were just, I mean, I don't know how we can imagine it now, although we have ISIS videos at our fingertips. But the idea of watching murder out of nowhere, live, 
and that there would be no justice. Believe it or not, most Americans were interested in a trial and due process of who the hell was this 24-year-old kid yeah. if he was the guy. And that idea that there was nobody in charge, I feel, was a real, not that America hasn't always had some disrespect for authority, and we are a subversive country, but there was a real blow to the, cons there was a real um, check in the nihilism column in terms of what mattered. And for Betty Draper, I think that was the end of her marriage. And yet, when you examine these, uh, this impact, this, the way that personal lives intersect with great historical events, yeah. television is often the mediator there. And yet, you don't do the thing that a lot of films that are about American history do, which is everyone is watching the report of Kennedy's assassination at the same time in 17 different locations. Right. This is something I've never seen done before on series television. There's been a lot of television that's set during the 60s, during these era, and they have their JFK episode, right. their MLK episode, but what you did that was so, I've, I've never seen this before, showing how that is just one thing that happens during the day. That you yeah. find out the president has been shot, that a senator has been shot, that some legislation has been passed, but you discover it when you're on the way home from the supermarket with your grocery bags in your hand, and the Kennedy episode, there are people who actually find out at the moment it happens, people who are completely somewhere else right. doing something. Well, that, that was, in, you know, life goes on. That's the story of the show. Yeah. Life goes on. It's told on a human scale. Everyone doesn't stop for everything. To, to take a historic event like an election or like 9-11, which is really the most comparable thing I can imagine in, in, in my lifetime, and say, like, everything stops for that. And yeah. you watch TV, and then what happens? And when I found out the story about the guy who had an apartment who unplugged the TV, yeah. he was like, he didn't know what happened, but he knew he wasn't gonna, he had waited for two weeks to get this apartment. He knew he wasn't gonna have his assignation yeah. if this news came out. And then afterwards he was preoccupied and he had to find out. <laughs> you know, um, it sounds, it, it, life, life goes on. You know, people, it's what Joan says at the end of the episode. You know, Greg's at the hospital, there are babies being born, people dying, and that's, you know, we, our role in history is, is, it affects our lives, but we're, we're you know, voyeurs on, uh, uh, on some level. And it's a myth to suggest that everyone is in the same place and has the same experience and hears about it and knows about it, you know? And when we narrativize our lives after the fact, some of us are more quick to integrate that historical experience into it. And others, it may be when they're 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. Or never. Or never. That's I mean, right. the, the, the the, Kennedy was shot on a Friday, Oswald was shot on Sunday, Monday was the funeral. Monday was a national day of, I mean, any other country in the world, there would have been a week off, he would have laid in state, it would have been, and someone realized that for America, the job was to get back to work. The next Thursday was Thanksgiving. And in my anecdotal research, asking people, what was that Thanksgiving like? Most people were like, that was Thanksgiving? <laughs> it was, it was, pretty normal. Mm. It was Thanksgiving. And uh, I'm not saying that it wasn't on people's minds, but it was, an, uh, it was Thanksgiving. And that, uh, I was like, did you have Thanksgiving? Did you not celebrate it? Did were what was going on? No. On the other hand, if you want to find a, a newspaper from the moon landing or from the Kennedy assassination, you can find it because they were saved. Right. You know, we did a thing last year where Megan was moving her things, you know, and, uh, and there was a JFK paper there, and I was like, she saved that. People saved it. They knew what was going on. That was an interaction with, a, with an event. And it's interesting, too, because a lot of what I'm hearing is from children of the period, and it's horrible to say, but 1968, with all those assassinations and, you know, the, the Russians rolling into Czechoslovakia and Mexico City and the Paris strikes and the... The, the student strikes and you know the Democratic convention. You talk to someone as a kid, and they will t admit to you it was really exciting. Yeah, we're not allowed to really say that. That's something else that comes through when you're watching the show, and it's something that people who lived in the era may have even forgotten, and people who didn't live in the era need to need to be told this. It all happened in a very tight time frame, very very tight time frame. And when uh, and I was telling uh, uh, my daughter that the Beatles from the time that the Beatles became an international phenomenon to the time they broke up was about six years. Yes. That's something that seems like amazing even to me. And that is quite a period, creative it, output. It is, and, and, but you're looking at the 60s and, and history is, it's, it's almost like you would say there's too much going on. There's too much going on. You there see is that and there the is show. and there are some years where there's nothing going on. You know, yeah. uh, the interesting thing is, is that there is a 
turnover in the fashion and so forth and the culture that is really rapid. And our openness and appetite for new ideas, new culture, new clothing and everything, I don't think, I think it's unparalleled. I mean, it really is. That's part of why I like 1960 as a place to start because our interest in like foreign design or whatever, I mean, we'll take new technology and new design with our phones now all the time, but for the most part, you and I, I mean, I don't blame this on Mad Men, you and I are dressed the way men have dressed for a long time. Pretty much, yeah. And uh, We don't have a lot of imagination. We, we, don't scare us. You wouldn't wear a dashiki. No. Well, maybe later. We'll see. <laughs> I mean, it's just interesting that, that it, it was a lot happening. And at the same time, you don't know that when you're in it. Yeah. You know, the last seven years, I can't even tell you what's happened. It's been a lot. You know, Obama was not the president when we went on the air. It did not even seem like a possibility. No Twitter, no iPhone, no iPad, no streaming. I mean, it's the default changing. position yeah, yeah. of walking down the street was not this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Trying to explain to my kids what it was like to have to meet somebody somewhere before there was a phone. <laughs> yes, I've tried to tell them. Where to my kids. are you? It's barbaric. I don't know where you are. I'm, I'm yeah. exactly where I said we'd be. <laughs> I can't. I can't call you. I can't do anything. I'm here. All right. I might. Looking back, looking back on other eras, though, there's something, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a scold when it comes to this, but there are moments on Mad Men where we see how people acted, the things that they did, the things they took for granted, the attitudes that they very casually espoused, the sorts of jokes that they told, often sexist and racist jokes. Right, that never uh, happens anymore at all. Oh, God, no. <laughs> and the, and, and the, uh, going out on a picnic and leaving your trash behind, I remember that was, that was quite a, a little bit yeah, I had to. Moment. It was that's the thing people come up to me and talk to me about on the show all the time. I had to explain to the actors, because they're too young, that yeah. the whole world is a garbage pail. Right. And that I do not look back, it will be fine. Do, does it bother you, though, when you see reactions to those sorts of moments on the show that seem to come from a, you just made a joke about this, that we're not racist anymore, that, that we are now so enlightened that we can look back on this and laugh? I don't I, mind, I that you no, don't I don't mind that, that reaction. I don't mind that reaction. I mind the people who argue about it. Yeah. You know, when someone who is completely uninformed says something like, that wasn't like that then, and I'm like, right, because I just threw it on the show. <laughs> You know what I mean? You don't think I researched it to see if that was it? That, you know, it, 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 some of the things are surprising. That's why I'm doing it. That's why I used, you know, I Got You, Babe at the end of 1965 because I thought, like, I, this song is still in our life. How could that be? No one knows that song's it's Groundhog that old. Day. That was an unfortunate coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't realize that it would be way more famous for Groundhog Day, even though I love Groundhog Day, than it would, could be seen out of context in the show. But, I mean, you know... You're, you're, not, you're not reminding people of something just by accident, you know, you're just trying to tell them this is when it happened. When is the first time Vietnam's going to be mentioned, you know? When is the first time, uh, uh, just reminding people of the fact that, that JFK is a political candidate and that people are saying crappy things about him before he dies. Right. And it's a real election where people throw mud and everything. I want, you know, that, that's sort of like, that's not revisionist, that's just, I've had people come up and say like, you know, People really smoked inside? Right. <laughs> they had bars and offices. I have actors who have never dialed a phone. <laughs> and they put their fingers in the hole. <laughs> you remember how it used to be that if somebody had too many nines or zeros in their, in their number, you'd be kind of My home phone number. When I was a child, the last four digits were 2,000, and you just used to sit there and go like, and you'd, and you'd cram it. You'd try and race it back, you know? I don't feel like calling home. Yeah. And yet I don't feel that, uh, although it's a source of humor on the show sometimes, it's a, very, it's a very sort of droll sort of humor. I don't feel that you're looking back on the past on attitudes that have changed and, and being smug about it. I hope not. I mean, I know there's some criticism sometimes where people are like, look how smart we are. And I'm like, you know what? Don't watch the show. <laughs> there are some, there's one winky joke in the pilot. And the rest of the time I said, no winking. Yeah. And I couldn't resist it. And I didn't know what the tone of it would be, but I couldn't resist it. When, where Don says, it's not like there's some magic machine that makes identical copies of things. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I apologize. Well, you don't have... I'm a joke whore. I just couldn't resist <laughs> it. But for the rest of it, it's always been like they don't know. And it's not like it never occurred to them. When we did this story about the computer, you know, 
the monolith. Yes, the monolith. And there's some conversation about how obvious it is. I'm like, if you could not tell that we were saying it was obvious, that the people who are there know it's obvious, yes. that they are aware of the fact. I mean, uh, R-U-R, the, 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 the play from the 20s, I think it is, that yeah. where robot is invented, it, it's the first suggestion that this will replace humanity in some way, even if we create it, you know? Um, Philip Dick is already writing, I think, at this time. I mean, it's just like, it, it, Stanley Kubrick has already done how. Right. So I just want to say, as Don said, it's not symbolic, it's quite literal. That's yes. where we used to have lunch. <laughs> right. This is a sign of uh, our reliance on this machine we created. It is replacing people in some way. And for someone like Ginsburg, the, the whole Ginsburg story with that to me, just to have a chance to say it in public, is um, I found that there was such a vein of absurdity and absurdism by the end of the 60s, mostly because of the, of the, of the war, mm -hmm. of the, 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 the difference between the way we wanted to be and the way we were behaving, of the powerlessness of the public. The war was not popular. And even there is a, the, the silent majority was very quiet and not a majority. And, uh, you know, as Lyndon Johnson said, you know, Walter Cronkite turned against the war. Richard Nixon ran on a, on a platform of ending the war. The war was not popular. And so this absurdism, this catch-22 era, like, why are we still, we were the most advanced society in the world. Why are we bombing these people? Why are we, you know, what's the, is it the military industrial complex? A million reasons. And I wanted to catch that. The, the error of that insanity and uh, paranoia, if you'll have. And it was built in that the Ginsburg character was you know, mentally on the edge anyway, so it seemed like an appropriate thing to do. But yeah. do People focused on things before technology. You know? Before there was tinfoil, there was a wooden hat, I'm sure, that was blocking, <laughs> blocking waves for the mentally ill. Feeling that, you're, that your mind is being controlled is, an or, is part of organic disease in the human being. We don't know what makes it go wrong, but that's, technology has played very effectively into it. Yes, yes. Well, speaking of, speaking of uh, historical attitudes, let's, let's uh, watch the first clip, okay. which is from the pilot episode. And you, you, here we go down, down. Are we gonna be blocking the clips? Should we? I don't know. Are, I have I a weird feeling so. they're gonna be playing on our faces. Are we? I guess we'll find out. It'll I'm be... technologically, I'm perfectly capable of getting up well, maybe and moving they can out of the way. <laughs> they can crank the Velvet Underground. It'll be fun <laughs> to show. Um, so this is from the pilot episode. You all will remember this. And this was, for me as, as a viewer, the first inkling that this was not going to be one of those shows that s sticks an audience surrogate into a historical yes. drama to make you comfortable with your Modern attitudes. Yes. Okay, so here we go. That's interesting. Wow. Oh. We're just blocking a few. How do I put this? Have we ever hired any Jews? Not on my watch. <laughs> That's very funny. It's not what I meant. We've got an Italian, Salvatore, my art director. That won't work. <laughs> Sorry. Most of the Jewish guys work for the Jewish firms. Yeah, I know. Selling Jewish products to Jewish people. That's very good. It's just at our 11 o'clock with Mankin's department store, and I wish we had someone to make them feel comfortable. You want me to run down to the deli and grab somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Button. So why doesn't he go to one of the Jewish firms where they sell Jewish products to Jewish people? This is what uh, Pete Campbell asked her in that meeting. Yeah. Where you feel more comfortable. <laughs> where you'll be, I mean, that sort of sophisticated anti-Semitism is about the fact that we are, and she says, I don't want those people, I don't want someone from the same village as my father. Right. I want your kind of people. And the definition of white becomes very gray here. Right. That's the right word. For a second, uh, I thought they were going to bring in a, the, the, the uh, Sal, the Italian, in as a ringer. And no, they bring it, but that they bring in a guy from the mailroom. That's right. And, and uh, hope he doesn't talk. He had to be, and he and he goes to pour himself a drink, and everybody looks at him, and he's sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the Jewish part of it, the female part of it, all of it was basically sort of established the, the segregation, even in New York City. Yeah. And this is right out of the gate, though. This is yeah. not something where you waited four or five episodes to, to, to take the audience gently by the hand. This is immediate. 
This is the story of what it's like inside there. I, I grew up in Hancock Park in Los Angeles, which was like this until like 1999. Um, Cotillion, uh, segregated country clubs, and, and uh, you know, the LA Tennis Club was very proud of the fact that they had a black member. It was Arthur Ashe. <laughs> um, you know, uh, restricted was what they used to call it. And this is, you know, Reagan country, and that's the way Los Angeles was. And so none of this was foreign to me. I'd overheard some of this stuff working as a teacher. Pete's line, you know, I mentioned this in the forward, I think, adding money in education doesn't take the rude edge out of people. Mm -hmm. I heard somebody say that right in front of me, and I'm, and I'm, you know, right there, believe it or not, there are people who were unable to tell that I was Jewish, and um, which my parents would consider a compliment. That's their generation. Yeah. And, uh, so a lot of things were said in front of me. There's a lot of expressions of these sorts of attitudes that are not villainous. I, I, very rarely do you find somebody. That's uh, the word casual. A, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it is. It's institutional and it is villainous. Yeah. And it's uh, separation. And you know, uh, being of color, I mean, it's just uh, there's no way to cross it. Yeah. And uh, the opening scene of the show is Don interviewing this African American man who it, who it says in the in the script is. Is wearing is too old for his job, and his uniform is too tight. <clears throat> and the uh, proprietor of the bar comes over and asks if he's bothering Don. He says we're just having a conversation. And so Don starts interviewing him in a non-condescending way. He's doing market research. The and cigarettes. At the, yes, about cigarettes. And at the end, they bond over the fact that women are done dumb because they read magazines. Right. <laughs> so um, that's you know that's part of out, what they used to call outgroup denigration. And people are brought together by their prejudices and their hazing and so forth. So um, it's a lot of hazing and a lot of segregation. And the story of the show to me was, hey, did you forget? The first line I had in the pilot really was, I'm not going to let a woman talk to me like this. Yeah, right. And letting, you know, and I got my job on The Sopranos. David Chase pointed out the line. He was talking to me on the phone because he read it. This was my writing sample. And he said, I forgot people talk this way. Um, and whether it's gay people or, and it's not like they didn't exist in an open form. If you were a choreographer, you could let people know that you slept with men and be in the theater. But if you were in an ad agency, in yeah. a white shoe ad agency, yes, you couldn't. Yeah. And even declaring your Jewishness, you know, you see such such strange sort of ambiguity in the people's presentation of themselves. Whether it's writing in the third person or you know, J.D. Salinger or whatever it is, you know, whoever you want to claim as being part Jewish or all Jewish or whatever. Expressing the experience in terms of metaphor rather than literally. Absolutely. Yeah. I could not have put it better. That's exactly what it is. And, um, and here I was getting to write in the third person. Very proud of the fact of even using the word Jew. Very proud of the fact that I had this Jewish main character who announced that she was Jewish, mm -hmm. which I'm pretty sure is unprecedented. Uh, the, you know, there's a couple of, uh, you know, there was Molly Goldberg, obviously. There was Bridget Loves Bernie. Yeah. Um, there was uh, George Costanza, who was Italian. Right. Um, <laughs> After a while, even, even Seinfeld made jokes about that. Yeah, there was Sydney, um, the this shrink on on Mash, but these people, uh, Alan Arbus, but these people were a few few be, you know few between, and uh, maybe on L.A. Law, I think. Yeah. But for the most part, it was not part of the culture, and certainly not at this period. And, I, and, and it was interesting that out of the gate, it wasn't really recognized as anything. And I, I felt that it was important to say. It was important to say that this was, how do I say this in the most positive way possible? I'm, I'm not capable of it. So. Um, <laughs> no, I think that there's a, that there's a fair amount I mean, of, of self-hatred that goes along with, with with being part of the mainstream, uh, and well, I don't I mean, know. I mean, I don't want to knock Woody Allen because he's an idol of mine, and his work was so important, and he was so open about Jewish themes and so forth. But I imagine that in our house, some of the stuff like Radio Days was a little bit the way uh, African Americans felt about, like you know, Spike Lee. Some of Spike Lee's movies, it's like, yes, it's true, but do you have to tell everybody? Right. Um, and and at the same time, his the the. That character, especially Annie Hall, was so influential on a generation of comedy writers that almost everybody that I worked for for a long time and worked with was of an era that they were inspired to go into comedy because of Annie Hall. And they had married non-Jewish women, and they were particularly hard on Jewish women. Yeah. 
just like, you know, self-deprecating at the same time about themselves. They were, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the stereotypes are. Um, well, you but gotta, really hard on Jewish women. And I just thought, like, let me show you somebody who is, reminds me of the women in my life mm -hmm. and my parents. And, and let's see that generation that really, you know, that really, really put it out on the line there to, and were quite conscious of what was going on. And there's still women underneath. So, and even when, she, when, she, when, when, when Rachel finally ends up telling her sister Barbara about, about him, that, the sin, that she, she lies and says that it's about him not being Jewish. She doesn't tell, him, tell her until the next conversation that he's actually married. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah, and I think, we, I think we might have that one, too. The, okay. The, the, um, the betrayal, the betrayal of uh, Jewish women on the show is, is, is quite complicated and not just on the surface. Well, I don't want anybody to be on the surface. I yeah. mean, it's been one of the gifts of the show and the reason why we've been able to do 92 hours of it without repeating ourselves, and we really tried hard. I'm sure there's some examples, but we really tried hard not to repeat ourselves, um, is because all the characters have a reason for doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then so that you can have a story that's about Don's wife having a baby and Don feeling powerless and marginalized and like he's never going to be the dad he wanted to be and that he blew his marriage, and then Peggy can come in and look at the gifts and say, you have so much, you have, she says, you have everything and so much of it. Yes. And then Peggy starts talking about, is this her time and how she had a baby and gave it away. It's all in that conversation. That gift of, of, of acceleration in the story and depth to the people is all has to do with taking everybody seriously. This sort of Venn diagram of outsiderdom and insiderdom is a, is a big part of the show. You've got, there's got so many characters on the show, not all, but many, uh, who are striving to become parts of clubs that would not necessarily have someone like them as members. You, yeah. see, it with, you see with Jewish characters on the show, with a lot of the women on the show, a lot of the men on the show who are uh, straight and white and would seem to be a little more easily positioned to fit in, but, uh, but can't necessarily because of their own their class or because of something in their personality and all of that. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's America. Yeah. And I don't like sweeping generalizations about the show, but if you want to say it's the story of how we all feel like outsiders, absolutely. The only insider in this whole thing is Roger. And yeah. he, and, uh, <laughs> and he's, uh, and he's guileless and he's clueless and he, he, he survived all of it. He's done okay. I was just watching an episode. The only thing he can't, the only thing he's an outsider on is age. That's right. And he, you, 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 it's been fun to see that as an equalizer. I've used it from season one that you, you can't unring that bell. No, Everyone Joan, Joan will, you will shops about that pretty heavily. Don but, walks the stairs, you know, that's yeah. what that's all about. You can hit on my wife, but I'll always be younger than you. Yeah. <laughs> there was actually a moment in an episode I was watching just last night where Roger and Joan are in a, ho a hotel room, and he tells her story about how he hitchhiked around the world on a tramp steamer, and she says it was a yacht. <laughs> right. You know it was a yeah. yacht, and he says, well, somebody's, somebody's got somebody's to drive that yacht. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's got to sail those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, deal, so you deal with it in terms of metaphor, you also deal with it very directly, but you see characters who are, are, who are in the process of assimilating or who have assimilated or who never even have to face the issue of, of fitting in. Um, well, everybody comes from somewhere. Look at Pete Campbell. I mean, to explain yeah. to people that advertising was like show business to that uh, upper crust in New York City, it was really, a, as his father says, it's not a job for a white man. Right. It, is, uh, it is a lowly... Like you can go to the brokerage firm, you, you could not work at all. That'd be more, more likely. You could go you know, work at the family law firm, whatever it is. This is, a, this is like joining the circus. And so Pete has something to prove. And so he's in that. So he's immediately part of something else. You know what I mean? His ambition yeah. alone is different than his class. And yet even the characters who are uncaring or insensitive by our, through our eyes, yeah. through our enlightened 20th century, 21st century eyes, are cognizant of the fact that you have to, on some level, appeal to everyone. And that's what this uh, next scene that I want to show, which also has Roger in it, I love Roger, uh, <laughs> is about, and, and we'll get into some of the other issues related to that, but even the scenes that are not explicitly about Jewish characters, you get a sense of these, these white, sort of waspy characters being cognizant of the city that they live in. And, it's, and, uh, and, and, and conversant in the details, conversant in the culture. Um, right. Yeah, and so we'll, let's take a look at this next clip. 
So I pulled over to the side of the interstate and I let him out with his luggage and everything. <laughs> he is not related to me. Siegel's a very common name. You wouldn't want to think everyone named Rosenberg is related to you. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. Lord knows there's been plenty of prejudice in this country, but growing up in Manhattan, I've always envied the humor, the closeness, the way your people keep track of each other. So you married your way in, huh? I've always thought Jewish women are the most beautiful women in the world. Now that's a sales pitch. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm late. This is my son, Bernard. We're still on drinks. Roger Sterling, this is my wife, Jane. Bernie. Nice to meet you. I'm sorry about that. I took the boat out. We got stuck. Really? What kind of boat? Uh, no, you two can discuss the details later. My dad doesn't like yachts because last time he was on one, he rode steerage. And look where you are now. I've been trying to find out what uh, Roger thinks, but he wanted to wait for you. I wanted to wait for dessert. Make sure you like me. What's not to like? As I understand it, you're trying to get Manischewitz into the hands of different kinds of people. So to us, it seemed the key was, well, different kinds of people. If you ever look at the side of a bus, it's a moving billboard. The passengers can't see the ad, but everyone can see the passengers. The idea was to put a picture of the bus seats on the side of the bus, right below the window where the real people are, show the bottom halves of their bodies with a case of Manischewitz under each of their seats. So it looks like whoever's riding the bus has bought the wine. Isn't that clever? So you thought that up, huh? Well, I engaged some of our creatives ad hoc in anticipation of this dinner. I figured even if you didn't like it, you could see what we were capable of. I know it's good. Do we need menus? I do. I'm getting a Chateaubriand if someone else put it with me. I thought you liked the crab rangoon here. <laughs> I just had some. So, Roger. What kind of boat do you have? <laughs> There's so much. There are some non-stereotypical Jewish characters there that yeah. I know from my life: the young playboy, the uh, the assimilated couple. Um, Jane Siegel is it's immaterial to her; she's a princess. Yes, and I and I love the the, the the flickers of of concern in Roger's eyes that that he may uh, someday lose her because he's not Jewish. No, because he's not young and handsome. He already has <laughs> lost her. That's the premise of this thing, is they're already divorced. Yeah. And he's suddenly whipping out his Jewish relative to try and land the, uh, land, right. land the client. Right. This, um, this campaign, by the way, Erin Levy, who wrote the script, her uncle actually pitched this campaign. It was a real campaign for Manischewitz. That was Shevitz. a real campaign. Yeah. And um, I think it ran and everything, and uh, we were just like, we can't, we can't resist that. And it has, right before it, he enlists Ginsburg's help. And Ginsburg's like, why are you picking me? And he's like, because, you know, obviously. And yeah. he goes, uh, or, and that, that what I, my favorite one of these jokes in the show, I had this joke in there where um, he says, the clients are Jewish, Cooper says, and, and Roger says, how Jewish? Uh, <laughs> filler on the roof, audience or cast? <laughs> <laughs> but this is as we were. Filler on the roof, by the way, a gigantic Broadway show about shtetl. Jews. I mean, that in itself was part of what I was trying to say in the show is like, this is, we are an other, but we are also part of this culture. Right. And then when Norman Jewison made the film version, he cast an Israeli. Yes, actor. Norman Jewison, not Jewish also, by That's the way. That's right. That's right. Yes. He cast an amazing guy. Yeah. Come Absolutely. On. Absolutely. Topol. So this, so in, in this scene, uh, we yeah, were- I went to film school with, uh, with his son. Really? Yeah. Omer. Who used to, who had, who was younger, and had just come from Israel, but had the same voice, and he says, "Matthew Boyce, come here, I want to talk to you." And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, as we as we were talking uh, about yesterday, uh, this scene and some of the other clips we're going to see, they express this feeling of a, a complete culture in New York City, and something that every everybody has a stake in, and that everybody has to be minimally conversant in. In other people's Yeah, I mean, you cultures. know, uh, honestly, in, in the, um, uh, what's the Billy Wilder movie about the drinking? That, the it, Lost Weekend. I was going to say, it doesn't narrow it down. <laughs> yeah. Well, The Lost Weekend was written about his experience with Raymond Chandler. Yeah. And um, uh, he goes to, Ray, Raymond Land goes to hawk his typewriter, and it's St. Patrick's Day, but all of the pawn shops are closed. Right. 
because the Jews have agreed that they will close on St. Patrick's Day um, when the bars are closed if they will close the bars on Rosh Hashanah. Right. So that they, and right away I'm like, well, everybody knows what this is, you know. The, the guys from Lucky Strike, they know, what, they know what pastrami is. They're from the South, right? Yes. And you, and you were talking about something, you know, maybe we can discuss this a little bit. The idea that uh, Old Testament references were very common in American politics, that people were talking about... I just went to the Lincoln Memorial. You can't even believe what's, yeah. what, what Old Testament's all over and, Washington, and, and you're talking, And we're talk, people are talking about Israel. People are going to movies like Exodus, which yes. is mentioned prominently in, in and Babylon, read, and reading the, the book. episodes, yeah. right? Right. Yes, and, and, and it's, it's very much part of, the, part of the cultural conversation. Yes, and that, as well as this, the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur. Uh, no, the Six-Day War, is, at, is that the first one? Sixty-seven, yes. yeah, which was, you know, completely stimulated the imagination of the American public, because they were com they were totally outnumbered, and everyone expected them to be wiped out. With was the United States going to have to get involved? And this was this resounding military defeat that was completely tactical. Right. That's hence the Moshe Dayan references all over the show. He was a, he was a hero. I mean, we we uh, that poster that you see was a poster my parents brought at MoMA. It was on the wall right next to Hemingway and all these other people. These were fun people, Che, that you might want in your dorm room. And you glimpse it briefly, very briefly, in, in uh, Stan Rizzo's bedroom on the, on the wall above his bed. Of course, Which, my childhood relationship was, is there no eye under that patch? <laughs> <laughs> I used to look at it and think, like, what if it falls off in the middle of the night and there's just like a hole? Yeah. <laughs> so, this, so the episode Babylon uh, is... Uh, really, really a key one, and it, that's got all of the stuff related to the Israeli Tourism Bureau. Yes. Who, who come to the agency, they're looking to be represented, and it prompts uh, a lot of people in the firm to kind of have a little crash course there. But also Absolutely. Don, Don is put in a particular almost comic sort of position, which is he wants the, he wants an outside opinion, and he goes to Rachel. Yes. Who Rachel is on his mind. Yes. We know that. And so this is an opportunity for it to come up. And she says, I'm the only, I'm the only Jew you know in New York. <laughs> right, yeah. Right, yeah. But also, I, I, I mean, I, I was going to make this episode no matter what, if the show got to go. It was something I had in mind earlier. I wanted to show, honestly, the nostalgia of, of America's love affair with Israel, which is mentioned in the scene, and the blue and white hats and the kibbutzim and, and this very positive feeling that I had when I was collecting money. I don't know if it was America's problem with, with the Arabs, or if it was actually their love of Israel as the underdog or what it was. But I remember, and I didn't grow up in Manhattan. I did not grow up in a Jew, predominantly Jewish area. Yeah. Um, so I felt this positive thing. And I remember the president having a positive thing about it. And so to see um, at the same time that to Don, we are boat people. Yes. And we are... As Betty says, you know, her first kiss is from a Jewish guy. Those skinny kids in the boats, they're having fundraisers for these, for these refugees. I actually wrote down a few of the choice lines from this episode. We, uh, Rachel, let's see, uh, Rachel saying, I'm American and not very Jewish. Yeah. That's a nice one. And also, um, Sal, uh, this, and this kind of plays back into something we were discussing a few moments ago. He says, the Jews there don't look like the Jews here. Yeah. That was, that was a kind of a rumbly, you could feel the rumble in the audience at that one. And, that uh, said, that, you know, I didn't say there wasn't, that there aren't Jews who have experiences of self-hatred at yeah. the same time. Yeah. But there was a physical manifestation of like a kind of, uh, I don't know how to explain it, of, of uh, an ideal of beauty, if nothing else. And, and, and by the way, along with that, Moshe Dayan being a sex symbol. Right. And, and you know... I can name all of the, the, the actresses. All the Jewish families knew who they were. I don't know if the world knew who they were, that Lauren Bacall was Jewish or, you know. Right. They, they, they you know, Paulette Goddard. Or, I think there's a ton of them, but they, I don't know if they knew that. But it was a sort of like the same way that, that we were in. You know, I look at situation comedy in particular mm -hmm. as our jazz. It was our contribution that was very organic to our culture, yeah. but completely palatable in an almost unvarnished form. To, to the American public as a whole. Do you remember Brad Garrett's speech when he won when he won his first Emmy for Best Supporting Actor? No, I don't. He thanked the Academy for proving that a Jewish man could make it in show business. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had an expression which was, you know, think Yiddish, speak British. And they would, they would hide this, this on some level. But, you know, 
number one show when TV first went on the air was the Goldbergs, and it was big on radio, and so these are, whether these are stereotypes or not, the, the list of, of, you know, Jewish writers in, and comedians and so forth, whatever they change their names to or anything, is really, really big. And so I tried to kind of like remind people of the lack of separation and also of our non-whiteness, right. you know? Um, it's, it's interesting, you know, we, we are white, which has allowed us to pass so easily. And we are overrepresented for, for certain, but those are the values of our culture, you know? Betty telling the story of how the first boy that she ever kissed was, was a Jewish boy. And she says something that jumped out at me. He was very good looking, but there was something about him that was gloomy. That's Betty Draper saying that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I believe he was. But, yeah. You know, all the girls dyed their hair blonde right after that, she said. I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't mean this as a criticism, but my parents' generation is, is you know, they're Pete and Trudy's age. They got married around the same time as Pete and Trudy. And there was a drive for assimilation. There were some of them who were quite embarrassed by their parents' accents. When we cast Rachel's dad, I had a decision to make about whether or not he would have an intonation, but I knew he would, but that embarrassed me. The same thing with Ginsburg's dad. You're just sort of like, this is a steadle stereotype, and they, you know, and people, Jews like, you know, cringe at hearing it, but you're like, guess what? That's what they sounded like. That's where that comes from. Yeah. And and you know. Um, I wanted to get it right and to embrace it as um, a great transitional moment, you know, so that I can come up here, you know, and, you know, I had an agent, not one of my agents, an agent from another agency once who was very lockjaw, the, the, and he was not Jewish, and he sort of explained to me that he could be a, a, a lubricant for me to certain aspects of, of the culture and so forth, and I was like, I went to this private school in Los Angeles where I was like, you know, one of 10 Jewish people in my class out of 120 kids, or 20 Jewish people. I went to Wesleyan, where one day, at one point, there were no Jews, and I'm in that thing. Yeah. And I went to USC to go to film school. And I live in 2002 at that point. I don't need you to open a door for me, because I can, I, I, my parents have opened that door for me. And my dad is the first person that went to college in his family. And you know, there's a, a, a way, a little bit north and a little bit east of here, here, there's a neighborhood of about 30 blocks where you know, I think it's something like 25% of the Nobel laureates have, come, uh, have lived. Yeah. This drive and contribution is something I'm super proud of. And I don't want to like wave a flag and call attention to myself and like get killed for it, but I am yeah. very proud of it. And I, and I want to show it, especially because a lot of the story of what people love about advertising was the slow integration. Stan Freeberg, whatever you want to say, the Jewish sense of humor, subversive attitude from the Volkswagen ads, from, you know, the, you see these people's names, it's a point of view. They, are, they have a sense of humor that is going to be making fun of advertising. They're all over Mad Magazine. They're all, you know, this is. Ginsburg I mean, is on the inside of the advertising industry, and he has that sensibility. A lot that's what. Well, that's what happened uh, right around that time. And when people would sit, talk about the Creative Revolution, they're usually talking about DDB. And DDB is the, you know, she says it in the thing, Mr. Birnbach down the street. That's the Jewish agency, and they are known for, honestly, making fun of advertising. Yeah, there's a kind of ambivalence. And the Italians came at the same time, by the way. Jerry Della Femina will let you know that he was not allowed to work for Ford. Right. I mean, they just didn't want you. It's the same excuse as they use now. I don't know if they'll feel comfortable. Yeah. You know, when Cooper says about, you know, I, I, I believe that we have to hire black people, then I don't want them in the front office. You know, I don't want them out. That's not the face that we're showing to the world. Uh, I can't be myself around them. This was all said, and to remind people of Jews as other when you're growing up in New York City where we're so, you know, at ease, you know. Yes. Uh, I went to France. Years ago, three years ago, four years ago, sat on a panel like this, was asked about Babylon, said, well, I, you know, I'm Jewish and an American, and blah, blah, blah. I don't live in Israel, but, you know, the complexity of the relationship, blah, 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 of Jews, and, you know, we, we feel guilty because we don't live there, but at the same time, we support it, and then you don't want to make a comparison to the IRA or what, and the Irish Americans, you don't even know how to explain it, but this is us, and it has to be there. But that's an actual, actually an excellent setup for this. Can, can I just say yeah, one thing? absolutely. Um, we'll show the clip in a second, but 
all that came out of this is I went backstage afterwards and the woman who was my guide there, who happened to be Jewish, said, I can't believe you said that out loud. I'm so proud. And I was like, oh, am, am I in trouble? <laughs> 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 Do I need to get letters of transit or something? <laughs> no, it's just you just take it for granted. We're just like, we're just here. And, and uh, you, you don't even, I mean, there are some of you are old enough to remember it. There are people who are, my mother-in-law is a Hong Kong survivor. My parents are from the generation before that, um, with a noble history, and my great-grandfather being a deserter from the Austrian army. But um, <laughs> no, I mean, you just, that identity is the same story as Don's identity. It's like, how do we become white? How do I get my kid to go to Wesleyan so he can be in that law firm? What's it gonna take? Right. Time. It takes time. So let's watch this. And actually, could we, could we do the next clip also because it's short, just show them together? Thanks. Thanks for coming. Can I get you anything? No. How have you been? Fine. Tired. Doesn't show. We're in the middle of spring inventory. I hope you're not going to tell me that the grand plan for remaking our store has a hitch in it. You look beautiful. Urgent business to discuss. <laughs> Anything for the lady? Nothing for me. Mm, coffee. Irish coffee? Coffee. <laughs> Sorry. Business? Turns out Israel tourism is considering becoming a client, and I'm having a hard time getting a handle on it. And I'm the only Jew you know in New York City? You're my favorite. Jesus, Don, crack a book once in a while. I have. It's all sentimental. World War II trivia, oranges, kids in blue and white hats. They're doing a movie of Exodus with Paul Newman. Paul Newman, that's nice. Now I have two reasons to see it. <laughs> Damn it. I'll say one thing about Israelis. Don't cross them. <laughs> well, those people at the meeting were definitely Zionists. Zion just means Israel. It's a very old name. I'm sorry, I'm not an expert on this, and something feels strange about being treated like one. I just want to know something about it that doesn't come from some ministry of propaganda. Well, here's some more World War II trivia. They just arrested Adolf Eichmann in Argentina last week. Have you seen his resume? Okay, I deserve that. But I'm talking about tourists going to Israel. I don't know what I can say. I'm American, I'm really not very Jewish. If my mother hadn't died having me, I could have been Marilyn instead of Rachel. No one would know the difference. What is the difference? Look. Jews have lived in exile for a long time. First in Babylon, then all over the world. Shanghai, Brooklyn, and we've managed to make a go of it. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that we thrive at doing business with people who hate us. I don't hate you. No, individuals are wonderful. Is that what I meant? I don't know. A country, but those people, as you call us, well, it seems very important. Why aren't you there? My life is here. My grandfather came from Russia, now we have a store on Fifth Avenue. 
I'll visit, but I don't have to live there. It just has to be. For me, it's more of an idea than a place. Utopia. They taught us at Barnard about that word, utopia. The Greeks had two meanings for it. Utopos, meaning the good place, and utopos, meaning the place that cannot be. I have to get back to the office. I better not see this on my bill. <laughs> it's me, Barbara. Can you talk? She's still sleeping, thank God. What's on your mind? I think I might have <laughs> met somebody. You're not sure? That's good. He has some serious limitations. Does he work in the store? No, he doesn't work at the store. Well, he has a job, doesn't he? Yes. Then what's the problem? Would Daddy like him? Daddy would hate him. So he's not Jewish. Who cares what Daddy thinks? He's not your boyfriend anymore. Barbara, you're 28 years old. You work 60 hours a week. The last thing you want is to end up like Aunt Rosie lying to your nieces about how many engagements you had. Aunt Rosie wasn't lying. Oh, please. There was no Max the Communist. Does he have all his hair? More than I'll ever need. Is he funny? Sometimes. <laughs> After a couple. So he's a shicker. Daddy will hate him. I do feel this attraction. I want him, and I want to ignore everything else about him. It's 1960. We don't live in a shtetl. We can marry for love. I'm not sure people do that anymore. Why do you always have to be so cynical? <sighs> because sometimes... Things come, good things, but there's no future in them. You're a modern woman, Rage. Forget the wedding. Believe me, I'd do anything for some romance right now. <laughs> a, cu a couple of weird things. I haven't seen that in a very long time. The, the Greek, the definition of utopia, that I learned that in high school. Uh, and it blew my mind. I never forgot it. I learned it in the same class. It was utopian literature where I learned the thing about nostalgia, that, yes. it, was a, that it was a Greek word. The ache from an old wound. Yeah. 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 And uh, education is very important. <laughs> <laughs> I was a terrible student, but I obviously absorbed something. <laughs> and uh, I, have a, I have an Aunt Rosie. Front page Ro of the Daily <laughs> <laughs> I have an Aunt Rosie um, uh, who my grandmother couldn't get married because it was her older sister. And she was never married, and they eventually eloped. It was quite scandalous, but Rosie never married. Mm. And she was so mean. <laughs> and there was a Max How the mean was there she? was a Max the Communist. Oh, she was just very <laughs> all I remember is that the three sisters were together. Uh, the last time I remember my grandmother, her sister Gussie, and her sister Rosie. Rosie, the one who never got married, Gussie, and Gussie was widowed. My grandmother was widowed at that time, and my dad is there, the doctor. The, who they're very proud of, and we're at a, a deli in Rockaway Beach, uh, where they live. Um, and uh, <laughs> Gussie has ordered a plate of mushroom barley soup with no soup. <laughs> that, I, I, these are, this, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm talking about stereotypes here, and I'm gonna just give you a dozen of them. <laughs> but uh, uh, Gussie said something like, my Sam, my husband, is, uh, I, sometimes at night, I think he's there and he's pulling on the sheet. And I think I see him standing at the, at the foot of my bed. And first, uh, and Ro Rosie finally says, you're a lunatic. You're crazy. You're losing your mind. You're not seeing your husband. And Gussie like, is eating. And she goes, at least I had a husband. <laughs> <laughs> They're like 80. <laughs> 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 
so we have two we have two definitions of utopia in this scene. We have the good place and the place that cannot be. The subtext, obviously, being this is about Don and Rachel's relationship. Absolutely, but it also is about many of the characters on Mad Men. I think that that search for an ideal place that will make that. them happy, will make them satisfied, and their story will be it, they'll reach that place where we all lived happily ever after. Yeah, and, and they uh, have to reinvent themselves often to get there or kill their old identity. Her whole expression of her relationship to Judaism, it was something that like, and I'm not as secular as some people. I actually, you know, and it happens, it obviously can change sometimes when you have kids as well, but I was never that secular. I always kind of liked it. I think actually because it irritated my parents. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are more secular. We were bar mitzvah and everything, but they're more secular, and then I was sort of into it. Also, I really did well in Hebrew school and when I wasn't doing well at regular school, so I kind of like, all of a sudden, they were patting me on the back, and I'm like, oh, I'm worth something somewhere. <laughs> and, um, but uh, that's a, a self-described attitude of I'm not that Jewish. It's basically, basically saying, you don't see me, I'm not wearing a yarmulke. And very much, like, you know, that's not brand new in America. That's not brand new at all. It's not brand new in Shanghai or any of the places she's talking about. Jews go there, and you see, unless they're, it's mandated by the government, that they wear these outfits. I mean, the, the Hasidic outfit, for example, I think it's confusing to a lot of people who aren't Jewish, but that is a uh, Middle Ages, you know, uh, German outfit, basically, that has, you know, seems oddly similar to what the um, Amish wear, because a lot of it's prescribed, you know, in the Old Testament in terms of, like, making yourself separate and how plain it is and so forth and where they find decoration, And but this is, this is all, like, I'm not an expert on any of this, so if I got any of this wrong, I'll let you know, but uh, you let me know. But um, the making yourself separate and the, the, the modern orthodoxy, which is what my grandparents were in, where you would, for example, keep kosher in the house but not in, outside you know, the house. So you, you go to Florida and see people eating like piles of shrimp. <laughs> and then they're back home and it's okay. You know, We yeah. never had bacon in our house. We never had any trafe in our house, but I mean we would frequently go out for ribs. <laughs> not beef ribs either, and not kosher ribs. So, so that kind of like fitting into the culture and then, then not, not wearing, my, my family, my relatives are not necessarily from that tradition. They weren't you know, wearing payas, they weren't you know, part of the, the Hasidism is a, is a fundamentalist part of Judaism that's from Poland and I really, my, Ancestors don't really overlap with that. And my grandfather on my dad's side was extremely anti-religious, although my dad was bar mitzvahed. And, um, you know, it's where you draw the line. Yeah. It's, you know, it's part of filler on the roof is he keeps going with everything. I can stand this, okay. I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And finally he's like, I can't do that. Yeah. Like my daughter intermarrying, that's where I'm going to draw the line, you know. So wherever that cultural line is, Rachel's checking in with us on this line. Yeah. You know, and meanwhile, Catch Twenty Two, written by Joseph Heller, is like defined in the culture. It's already you know f five years old at this point. Right. So, where are we? Are we observers? Are we part of it? I think we're part of it. But she's just explaining to Don what it is, and I love that Don is striving for the same thing. They're both there with their fake success suits on. Right. Right. They're both one generation from living without plumbing. That's, that's, a, that's a very important part of the story. Maybe it, we can talk is, about this. Yeah. Don's story in particular, the idea that he came not just from poverty, but from rural poverty. And he yes. remakes himself as a sophisticated urban man. And it's the story of the 20th century. Yeah. And that's what I was interested in. And you can read these people's biographies, the great, uh, the people who've written them, autobiographies, and you will often find single mothers, if they're honest about their childhood. Which they know, often aren't. Which they often aren't. And you will find some shame that needs to be overcome. And yes, you would like, you know, to turn your name into an important name. A number of rich and powerful people have biographies that fit that definition that you... Uh, the ones I was interested in at the time, and there's so many more, but Sam Walton's biography is very sketchy. Uh, and interesting, I mean, you know, this is, I think, like the second richest person in the world. Um, with, a, with a family of wealth, and it's really from nothing, you know. Um, Lee Iacocca I was interested in. John D. Rockefeller I was interested in. Um, Bill Clinton, you know, the amount of 
presidents that we have who are raised by single mothers would shock you. I don't know what the statistic is, but it's way more than two. Yeah. <laughs> There's only 44 of them. I think it's, I think it's 10 or 15 yeah. when you scratch it pretty deep. So that family structure, the poverty, the evangelical Christian background, I have done everything I can to cast Don in what I believe is a, is a hero of assimilation. And that's a lot of the time why I, even though you see him give like, you know, uh, a lot of speeches, a lot of preacher speeches, like, like Jesus, you know, wants you to, you know, yeah. you either believe in the Lord or you don't. And you can see that he's from that tradition. Yeah, the come to Jesus moment. Come to that's, Jesus, that's exactly. That's not a phrase he uses no. in a light way. No, he, he's seen that in action. You don't learn how to talk like that without going to church anyway. I sincerely believe that. Yeah. Um, but then there's the, the, the rest of it, which is I'm going to try and become the guy that I saw on TV acting like a rich, powerful white guy. I was realizing... Uh, looking Don back, has it easier than Rachel. <laughs> looking, looking back on the show, the, the, Don has been compared to a number of kind of superheroic, mythical characters, pop culture characters. He's been compared to James Bond. Superman, Batman, Tarzan. I mean, I could keep going, but what a lot of these characters have in common, they often have two, one of two things in common, Moses. Uh, they, they were one person and they became something else, or they were, ra they were raised by somebody who was not their biological that's a, parents. That's a great, uh, that great uh, I, the first time I saw that analysis was, I think, a James Walcott article about the fact that Jerry Seinfeld and Howard Stern had biographies come out around the same time, and both of them were wearing a cape on the front. Mm -hmm. And there had already been this fantastic joke in Friends where they talked about how all the superheroes had Jewish last names, yeah. where they're like, who's coming over to dinner? The Supermans, the Spidermans, the Aquamans? <laughs> <laughs> the Batmans cannot make it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that this was a Jewish a story of assimilation, and that it was a Jewish fantasy, because these are obviously myths. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Yes, and Batman, also uh, Bob uh, Kane. Kane yeah. yeah, and there's and Stan Lee, and let's not, right. it's just a lot of it. It's it's, uh, and the story being that you know, my parents are from another planet. Those are not my parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, when I take my glasses off, I am I can fly. Speaking of parents from another planet, that's the perfect segue for this next clip that we're going to show you where okay. we get to meet the character of Ginsburg. You all know Ginsburg, but I mean in this room, so mm -hmm. let's do that. Hello, I'm Peggy Olson. Michael Ginsburg, lead the way. No, we're meeting here. So, uh, what's he like? Is he like a firm handshake kind of guy? Excuse me? Don, I want to make a good impression. You could help me out. No, I'm interviewing you. I'm a copywriter. Have a seat. So is Don stopping by? Nope, it's just me. Can you hire me? Well, no, but I'm the first round. Wouldn't you want to talk to the person who could hire you? I spent three weeks dancing at that crappy New York satellite, a Leo Burnett. Never met him at all. Turns out, Leo's not a real person. Yes, he is. Is Don a real person? Because I'd really like to meet him. I'm the person you need to impress right now. You looked at my book. What more can I say? OK. <laughs> I liked your work. And I like your work. You thought I was a secretary. Do you have a current resume? Alan Ginsberg? He's the most famous Ginsburg there is. I figured we gotta be related somehow. <laughs> and what's he gonna say? <laughs> okay, well, it was nice meeting you. Ah, oh, nuts. Listen, my stuff is good. You can see advertising ain't my day job. Look, you're a fair woman. I insulted you because I'm honest, and, and I apologized because I'm brave. I didn't pick this profession, it picked me. I, I didn't have any control over it. Turns out, it's the only thing I can do. Your work's very impressive, but... Here's some other advantages. I have no hobbies, no interests, no friends. I'm one of those people who talks back to the radio. No girlfriend, no family. I will live here. And you're like everyone else. I've never been accused of that, but I really am trying. <laughs> I don't know. 
You can't act like this with Don. Like what? We'll call you. Okay. You know, your book really does have a voice. That's what they said about Mein Kampf. Kid really has a voice. <laughs> <laughs> He's a stitch. Yeah. He's, uh, he's in the mold of, you know, he's a genius who has no social skills. And uh, he really seems clueless in the entire process. And, and I love the fact that he is so terrible at the interview and so incredibly confident about his work. And that's kind of um, in the mold of the kind of people. Uh, uh, I mean, he's a specific character. He's not modeled on anybody. But I did believe that that it would take something like that to break through. Yeah, he's, and he's not wrong. He's not no. wrong. The work is good enough that he can, it's a saving grace. Yeah, you gotta really be good if you're that out of it. Yeah. <laughs> you got, you can't, can't get away with that crap unless you were amazing. Yeah. Yeah, there's a touch of, there, there's, a, there's a, a harbinger, we talked about this a little bit before, but for me, uh, a, a sense of the kind of, of male Jewish leading character who was gonna become more common in the 70s in this character, where like more in a Richard, like a Richard Dreyfus. Oh yeah, he's a, he's a high energy, yeah, I could yeah. see that. This yeah, I mean, it, that's this, derived from real life, you know what I mean, this yeah. is, this is, uh, what? No, I said I could see Richard Dreyfus. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Dustin Hoffman, I mean, it's, you know, there's, I, I don't want to tell you, he's obviously smart, he has no social skills, he's, Obviously not a sexist. He's just terrible to everybody, yeah. and uh, and he's a little off. But I think that that that's what I was saying about being subversive. I think that's the that's the tone that created. I can't believe I ate the whole thing. You know, right? Uh, if you, anybody remembers that ad campaign, there's just an attitude of like advertising's dumb. Let's sell you something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and going for the laugh, going for the going for the going for the belly laugh, but also the self-aware belly laugh. Yeah. That was something that came out of that, that late 60s kind of. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the, I would, can only describe it as subversive. Yeah. You know, uh, watching the Roseanne show uh, in the midst of, you know, uh, right after the Reagan era and seeing, you know, this character who, it, it's supposed to be middle America, it's the most popular thing on TV, and it's basically saying the country is crappy, things are unfair, the government doesn't care about us, uh, we can barely hold our families together because it's so economically uh, uh, unjust. And that's where we get it out. That's the, the success in American entertainment is by telling the truth. And by the way, just despite the red state, blue state thing, that's, those kinds of feelings, they cross over all over the place in the United States. So, <clears throat> and of course, Roseanne, the, the, I, I've never, I don't know if this is, I've never had this verified, but apparently the first season of the show, they told her, well, we want to have a Christmas episode. And she said to ABC, but the Connors are Jewish. <laughs> and they said, no, they're not. <laughs> there's an, there's an, uh, a kinship, you sense an immediate kinship creatively, if in no other way, between Ginsburg and Don Draper. And Yeah, oh, I, I, I would agree with that, yes. And, and there are a they lot come things, head to head, I mean, you know. And, and him he's refusing a threat to, to Don, recognize Don's authority. He seems to not really recognize anybody's authority. He has to remind himself. Don recognize doesn't recognize authority. anybody's authority either. That's part yeah. of the job. Yeah. And you kind of get away with a lot being a writer in any profession, where you basically are allowed to, the, the, the hierarchy and the creative process are always at odds. And there is a little bit of like, you know, the show business thing of like, you know, someone at the very bottom comes with the, the best idea. It's how Peggy has a job. You know, it is a meritocracy on some level. And being a jerk and a boob and like disrespectful and all these other things, it doesn't matter. Showing up late, showing up drunk, whatever. You know, it was very early in my career that I realized that, that they were giving the writers on a sitcom, on a network television show, a multi, multi million dollar business, fake deadlines because they knew we, we were going to meet, we were going to need, the, we wouldn't make the real deadline. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. I've never had anyone do that with me. Yeah. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> there, so many of Don's campaigns are brilliant, but also very problematic. And he has batting averages. You, we think of Don as the guy who nails everything, but 
a lot of his pitches have to be watered down or they're turned away because they're too, there's an undertone of contempt to some of them. Really? Yeah, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a consciousness of advertising as advertising. There's Don's? A, yes, or, or, I think so. I don't think so. You don't I, think so? No. I think Don's advertising is uh, cutting edge and that clients are disappointing. <laughs> and and that's, that's, the, that's the story. Yeah. Don's, Don's ad for, you know, I remember reading this actually, it might have been you, who thought that, the, that the Don's, Don's campaign about Hawaii with the guy walking off into the water, that that was like a, uh, a show that he'd lost his mojo because the client didn't like it. Well, I write the client and the pitch. So, I yeah. mean, it's all phony anyway. Yeah. But that, that, that campaign... Uh, it was supposed to be 1968 when he pitched that. That yeah. is a 1975 home run. The abstraction, the undertones of death or darkness, it's all over the place in about five years. Um, you in, know. In season four, he gives an interview in which he kind of, he kind of positions himself as a star. Like, like he's stepping out from behind the curtain. He's told that he better, you know, this is the thing about having a fake identity. Yeah. He's now, his name's on the firm, and he goes in there, and he's super modest, and he gets killed in the paper. And they're like, you better go in there, and you better own it. Mm. You better be, you better act like you, you better act like you're somebody. He even lies and says they have a second floor. He gets along with the whole, it's called public relations, because it's all about lying. <laughs> and that's Don kind of taking responsibility for being the boss. But I find, I, I, I really like to know a campaign that, I mean, that Hilton campaign, I'm thinking the ones that got rejected, you know, Don's, Don is not a fattest. No. And I think a lot of advertising people, they really, really cash in on the fad. Mm -hmm. uh, they cash in on technological fads. You'll see these amazing, uh, uh, amazing changes in technology where they'll be like, you know, what, like something like CGI it will go right from the big screen and the next place you'll see it is on a sit and sleep ad. The obsession with the slow motion and the Heinz Big Bean ad. Absolutely, that, that camera just come out and they're gonna, they're gonna co-op that immediately. And they should, they can afford it. You know, um, the, the Matrix, those, those techniques that were developed for the Matrix, they're in car ads like within a few hours. And Haskell Wexler who shot a lot of ads and I think continues to actually, still alive, yeah. um, he's always like, you know, why wouldn't you want to do an ad? Forget about being part of the machine. They're going to pay you a ton of money and they're going to give you the best toys yeah. and plenty of time to do it. So, um, but I, I, I don't think, I, I, if, well, there, me, if there's me, a conception that Don's advertising is dated or bad in some way. Oh, I don't think uh, that. Or, or, or that, he's, that he doesn't succeed that much. It's crazy. I mean, that's what we've been trying to show is the reality of the creative process is that, you know, um, you're talking to someone who had their script rejected for seven years, yeah. right? Who literally every single person would, that I met would say, this is great, what do you really want to do? <laughs> and you know, to go on the air on this network no one had ever heard of with like a million person audience and win the Emmy, you know what I mean? It didn't mean that my script was suddenly good. Right. So I, I identify with that struggle of creativity and I actually feel like it's part of my, I'm not bragging about that, I'm, I, it's part of my mission in success to tell, to encourage people to not listen to people who don't know, just because people don't like it doesn't mean it's good, not good. There's a, there's a moment right. that's kind of crucial in this. When Don gets the research in from, from Dr. Fay, and uh, she says, um, you know, people don't like this idea, and he goes, they never heard of this idea. Of course they don't like it. You know, let's see, once I do it, it's going to be their first choice. That is true, you yeah. know? And, of course, Don is trying to win. And Don thinks he knows what's best for the, for the client. And Don thinks it's better to take a risk. And a lot of times, people are paying a lot of money. They don't want to take a risk. And they back off. They back way the hell off, like, right away. So I think it's always determined by, by the adventurousness of the client. And I got that, not because I've ever been in advertising, but because I worked at a company... Um, at AMC and their whole willingness to take this gigantic risk on this TV show is because they had nothing. And I think the less you have, the more, the bottom of the market is where the excitement is if you, right. or, or, you, or you just go out the door. That's why ABC gave a green light to Roots. I, ABC is like a great story uh, cyclically. I totally believe that. ABC yeah. is, 
you know, once Dumont is gone, ABC is the joke network. That, J right. Jimmy Barrett was on ABC. They would take a chance on things. You actually make jokes about that on Mad Men. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Like, whenever there's a cockamamie idea, it's like, we'll take it to ABC. Yeah, ABC was the, yeah. they were the high risk network. Yeah. And then, of course, in my childhood, they were Aaron Spelling. It was, you know, that was, what, weren't those all ABC yeah. shows? That yeah, was everything. Yeah. It was next on Fantasy Island. <laughs> Fantasy Island, yeah. Love Boat, Starsky and Hutch. I mean, I, I wasn't, you know, it, it's hard. It went from CBS to ABC. Yeah. But I guess I don't want to be misunderstood here. I wasn't suggesting that they were no, you're bad. You're entitled to. I just I, no, not that they were bad ideas, but that I feel like Don and Ginsburg are both operating a couple of conceptual levels up with a lot of their pitches. And, and I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I would agree with that. I think that and the interesting thing the for me is, Don, yeah, Don, I mean, when they're trying to do that Jaguar pitch, and Ginsburg comes in and says, I got it, I got it, I got it. Mm -hmm. He talks about the asshole who's gonna buy this car. Yes. And Don's just right. like, what? <laughs> I know you told me not to pitch this again, but I'm gonna pitch it again. And this is me being in the writer's room on both sides. I've been Don and I've been Ginsburg. And him basically saying, saying what it's gonna be, and Don just going, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Solving the problem, the aha moment, I mean, it's really, I've tried to capture it as much as possible for the audience, and, you know, it's just, we all get to have it in life, and if we're lucky, it is the highlight of the creative experience, and it's the, that is the, is the, is the thrill of the job. Yeah. For Don, he's got the extra thing, which he knows how to sell it to the client, and Ginsburg doesn't. And Ginsburg is a creature of pure imagination a lot of the time, but he's not, yes. he's not glib. No, that's, I, that's, one, that's one of the things that I, I think you may read his energy as being that kind of sarcastic, yeah, edgy sort of humor, right. that Richard Dreyfuss kind of yeah. quality, but there's something very, very morally serious about this guy. I always thought about Nathan and Sophie's Choice. <laughs> that's what I expect from this crowd. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. If you didn't read the book, he was played by Kevin Klein in the movie. There's a, it's... It's the cliche of the of that of mental illness giving you insight. It's just a, just on the edge of things, and not having the social skills and not wanting to have the social skills. But what he says in that interview is, "I don't have this is not my day job." That in itself is refreshing for them. Yeah, to have someone who actually comes in and wants to be an advertising that's fresh, and um, you know, he's 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 the next wave. It's the next wave. Let's take, let's take a look at, this is I think maybe our last clip of the night, the afternoon, uh, gives us an insight into where Ginsburg, in many different senses of the phrase, is coming from. Why didn't you tell me you had a family? Your father's nice. He's not my real father. People don't understand. Are you adopted? Actually, I'm from Mars. <laughs> it's fine if you don't believe me, but that's where I'm from. I'm a full-blooded Martian. <laughs> don't worry, there's no plot to take over Earth. We're just displaced. Okay. I can tell you don't believe me. That's okay. We're a big secret. They even tried to hide it from me. That man... My father told me a story. I was born in a concentration camp, but you know that's impossible. And I never met my mother because she supposedly died there. That's convenient. Next thing I know, Morris there finds me in a Swedish orphanage. I was five, I remember it. That's incredible. Yeah. And then I got this one communication. A simple order. Stay where you are. like you? I don't know. I haven't been able to find any. I also, I also love that, that almost that entire monologue, when you yeah. see his face, it's, it is not him, it is a reflection of him. Yeah. That's one of those lovely understated directorial touches that I think distinguishes the that show. That was in the script. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> it's it's be it's beautifully directed. Yeah, it is yeah. beautifully directed. Yeah. And the performances are there and he got what I wanted. Um 
And, and Ben had never had a part this big in his life and was terrified. And terrified to be giving the whole thing to, 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 with his back. Where did you find him? My casting people found him. And uh, he's a working actor. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how we find everybody. I have incredible casting directors and they bring in a bunch of people and I try out the scene and then some of it's instinct. You know, they found him, I picked yeah. him. Um, that's their job. Mm -hmm. And they really have brought me just an incredible a bunch of people. But um, no, I mean, he says displaced. I mean, that was what they were called. Yeah. And the influences here are not just my, my mother-in-law, who is, who is uh, a, a Holocaust, a child survivor. And the idea that the, of how people were integrated back into the culture. And the fact that babies were born there, but also, uh, I mean, Art Spiegelman is, has had a tremendous impact on telling the story of what it means to become an American and in, with this as a shadow. And that generation really had to, you know, the, it's, it's a tenuous relationship. I mean, uh, Isaac Singer, Enemies a Love Story. Mm -hmm. Just the whole idea of um, where do you belong? And, you know, you take that version versus Rachel Mencken's you know, growing up, her parents, her dad starts off with a sock store, and they end up, you know, with the with Bergdorf's. Yeah. You know, because these are the tales, and uh, that's the most recent wave. So I thought that gave him his point of view, and he probably, I mean, we don't know he's really seriously unbalanced at this point, and I think a lot of the audience thought it was a metaphor, and it is a metaphor, but you know that's what he feels like. Yeah. That his reference to talking back to the radio takes on a whole new light once you know how this story ends. It's been there the whole time. That's yeah. all I can say. He talks about having, you know, when the Manischewitz pitch, he's like, I don't want to do it. You know, because Cutler says to him, you know, he says to Cutler, you're a fascist. And he's like, you, you know, when they're talking about taking the Vietnam plank out of the, out of the, uh, at the Democratic Convention. And, the, and Cutler's like, you know, I, I was in the, in the Air Force. You know, we find out he flew over Dresden later on, <laughs> but, he, but um, uh, no less heroic, actually. And then who are these guys? And Ginsburg takes it very seriously. He's right. I'm a, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a death peddler. I'm whatever. And he describes this, you know, bomb going off in his brain. I know it all seems metaphorical, but none of this is inconsistent with somebody who's really on the, on, uh, on the verge. There's I do like him lying in the Superman vein about not having any parents. He says yeah. that in the, in the audition there with Peggy in the interview. And then you see him at the end of the episode. His father is so happy for him. He doesn't want, he doesn't want it. He doesn't want to be part of that. And that apartment set which Dan Bishop designed. John Hamm directed that episode too. It's really beautiful. And this apartment is exactly like one of these Rivington Street, you know, it's a cold water, the, the bathtub's in the kitchen, and I got a lot, and there's a window that is no longer, that's part of a room now, that used to be an exter exterior window. There's a lot of it that um, I think had uh, ethnic resonance for, some, uh, resonance for some of the audience. Yeah, you have, you have uh, I think there's a tremendous temptation, and I've certainly succumbed to it, to Think about this show so much in terms of the myth, the oh, myth, really? the symbols, the themes, and all of that, and yet, and you, and you definitely invite that the way that. The no, way I don't see anything wrong. I, I definitely think it's my job as a writer to say, like, hey, you know, we're not going to repeat ourselves, but you know, you might have heard some of this story before on account of being a part of Western culture. Right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and yet, and yet, uh, I was struck by in going back and reading articles about the show. Think pieces written about the show, regular just straight reviews. Uh, there's an immediate tendency to glom onto any major plot development and the introduction of any major new character, such as Ginsburg, in terms of what does it mean for the show's overall mythology and what is it and where is this going to lead in the future? How is it going to wrap up? Right. And and the characters ultimately in the end though are just people. And the, Gins, uh, Ginsburg doesn't lead us down some sort of garden path I think that wraps everything the, up in a neat bow. He's just a guy, and he goes out missing a nipple. I mean, yeah, I mean, and 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 as I said, that episode is a lot about Vietnam in my mind, where that happens. I think that um, a lot of what is unexpected for people and that therefore entertaining to watch the show is based on their preconception of television and entertainment as a whole. 
and the, des the desire that everything should, that is a plant or a payoff, and there's plenty of planning and payoff in the show. I mean, I definitely hope that, that, that there's satisfaction of stories, resolutions, you know? I do want to tell a story with a beginning, middle, and an end. There's no doubt about it. But I also feel like a lot of times we're playing on people's expectations of what is, what, how TV works. How, do you, I, think, how I, do you think they think TV works? Well, I'll just use an example. TV works versus real life. This is the example that I find ex explains it to people. On a, on a TV show, a guy meets a, a, guy meets a woman uh, at a party, and he gets her phone number, and he writes it on a napkin, and he puts it in his pocket. And then he gets home, and the pants get washed or whatever. He loses it, and he spends the rest of the time. And at the end of it, he goes to the dry cleaner and gets someone else's pants, and, but the guy's found the number, and he gets the number, and he calls the girl. On Mad Men, he meets the girl at the party. She writes the number on a napkin. He comes home. He finds out it's gone. He never sees her again. <laughs> That's the story of real life most of the time. You can't, you know, as we were saying, before the phone, you, you know, you're supposed to meet. That's why you would meet on the top of the Empire State Building <laughs> right. in a romantic movie because where else are you going to find somebody in New York? There's a lot of people. Right. And you'll have a newspaper under your arm or you'll be wearing a boutonniere or whatever else it is. Um, I, I play on that as much as possible, um, you know, right down to, you know, people get fired, they, they don't die, they just don't work there anymore, and you're never going to see them again, because you probably won't, because it's a big city, right? Right. That, and then it allows you for, to get into the coincidences of real life, which do exist, you know? Yeah. Sometimes they're unusable. We were just telling the story, uh, someone just told me a story about their little girl uh, goes to school at Oberlin, mm. and she needed to buy, they're from Los Angeles, and she needed to buy a, a used, uh, she bought a used copy of Jane Eyre off the internet, <laughs> and it showed up and it had her grandmother's signature in it. <laughs> I can't use that, because you're all gonna be like, come on! <laughs> Would it be okay if we took a few questions? I would love it. Okay. I would. I've long had this feeling that... I'd love to know your location. I'm over here. Oh, there you are. Okay. Right there. <laughs> Sorry. I've long had this feeling that, but for a couple of twists of fate, Don might have become a poet instead of becoming an ad man. Hmm. And it probably isn't the case, but I have to ask, did you name him Dick Whitman? With some kind of resonance? I know you, from interviews that you did, that you were heavily involved with poetry early on in your writing career and your life as a writer. Did you have that resonance when you decided to name no. the real Don Draper Dick Whitman? Or that was, was that was white man. That was just, oh, OK. Oh. I wish. Okay. I should have lied. You can, you, can, you can use that now. It's OK. I, that's all right, if you want to change it. I, I, you know, he's got away with words. That's part of being in advertising. And he's really good at it. And uh, I don't know if he's really good at advertising or he's just good at selling to the people we made up on the show. <laughs> but the important thing to me was that the audience believed it. And uh, they're more eloquent than regular people, but um, there is some poetry required. And I'm always wondering like, what, at what point the commercial draw was part of the conflict with Megan. The commercial draw of being in advertising takes you away from some higher art. And you know what? Some people, it's like, if you can get talked out of it, don't be a poet. <laughs> On the basis of the book that he was writing in The Summer Man, I wondered if he might someday have turned into Raymond Carver. Oh, yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was, that was my journal. So I, uh, was yeah, that was my journal. Nice work. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, you, that comes to you in a fragment, there's pieces that I've had of stuff I've written in my journal that I would read to the writer's room and say, like, can we just let the, let's let this inform the story. And inevitably, they would find a way to actually put it as in the story. Hmm. And constructing that montage of Don talking about what he wants to be and what he lost while he's watching Henry Francis live with his old family. That, to me, was like a great moment of, of clarity. Equally in the Martin Luther King episode when Don talks about his relationship with Bobby mm -hmm. and how you want to be the man who loves children. Like that was a thought I had that was a kind of slightly controversial thought that sometimes because you don't breastfeed and because you're a dad and you're a man or whatever, you're, you're, on, you're faking it a little bit. 
it's not that you don't love your children, it's not that you won't protect them, but you don't have that, you need to have that moment of their consciousness to get their full attention sometimes to feel the, the joy everybody's talking about. Yeah. And then, it, then, then you're, as Don says, your, your heart explodes. Okay. Hi, uh, you know, this is Howard Stern. I know Howard Stern talks about his childhood and how his mom always gave him the nighttime stories of how the Holocaust and those were his bedtime stories and how miserable. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so um, from your episode, it made me realize that the proximity to the Holocaust is really the proximity of our children to 9-11. It's sort of like this very close distance. It is, I wanted to call attention to the fact that it had just happened. Right. So. But I never real until I saw your episode. It, it was never not, even occurred to me that yeah. our parents made us go to Hebrew school. We needed to know Hebrew because they thought we might need to go to Israel. All these fears that they had weren't legitimized to me until I saw your episode because I have the same fears for my children with 9/11. The right. proximity of time. So I just was wondering if something happened in your child. Your um, no, my family uh, had a much more uh, secular version of the Holocaust because uh, other than one uncle. Uh, who was in Poland, um, who had come to the United States, who had not left Russia when everybody else did because he had business going on. They were in the fur business. My, my mother's family was in the fur business. My father's family was in the shoe business. Uh, I, all of this is all over the show. <laughs> and um, they, uh, my parents, you know, were definitely interested in it. And uh, we, you know, when my dad uh, is a scientist and ha was on sabbatical in Sweden in 1972, and we went and visited Dachau. I was seven years old. That definitely, at Anne Frank's house, and, you know, those Time Life books with all the Nazis in it. It was funny. When we tried to take, find pictures of the concentration camps to put in the show for Don to look at, we could not, I remember these, I mean, they're here at the museum, obviously, but there's a, there was a whole catalog of like hundreds of photos that were really gruesome that just disappeared, that just were not suitable for public consumption anymore. So I were, was raised in that environment and there was something in the back of our mind like, you know, you might want to be ready to go at any minute if you have to. Those people didn't leave in time or whatever the attitude was about it. But no, um, I want to say that though that these that these this Jewish generation that's going to be in advertising that some of them are right there. There's a there's something. There's a uh, we're a multicultural society and somehow Judaism never counted as part of that. And there was this wave of immigration of people who were coming out of something horrible. And that America was on the side of that at least publicly. We've heard all kinds of terrible stories about the government's behavior and everything. But there were Jews in the Roosevelt administration. And uh, as my grandmother used to say sometimes, we haven't had a Jewish president since Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Over there. Hey, Matt and Matthew. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Roberta Lip. I run a fan site called Basket of Kisses. And, um, yes. <laughs> and I'm, so this is such a wonderful conversation, um, specifically for me. And um, so I don't know if you remember this, but I was reminded, and this is Marley, who is one of our writers as well. She, remind, she reminded me also, there was so much speculation during season one. That Don was Jewish. That yes. Don was Jewish. Did you? To the point that I was like, oh my God, did I ever say he wasn't Jewish? Yeah, right. Like, and I don't remember where we that finally intonation. had to call the drop and say, okay, he's really not. I don't know when that, I don't know anymore when that was. But was that deliberate on your part or was it a surprise to you? And It was totally surprising to me and it was not deliberate at all. I wanted there to be a correlation from the pilot that they were having this similar experience and that Don had responded to it with this, you know, posture of existential, you know, uh, bravery. And then Rachel was like, huh, I know what it's like to be disconnected yeah. and uh, to watch people living a life. That's, her existentialism is rooted very much in being a minority, a woman and a Jew and fitting in and passing. This is what we were talking about. Right. We, woman we were talking about. So, yeah, and, but Don is from a very different religious tradition, and I hoped that by the time the Hobo Code happened and we saw his mother, uh, stepmother, excuse me, you know, uh, taking that money away from, the, from you know, her, her, that she was a holy roller, as they used to say, and you do hear him talk more and more about it, and I think by the end of season two, Cup of Loneliness 
you know, tells you that, that he's, he's in that tradition. But I, I do believe, um, especially back then, I guess we have it in evangelical circles now, but I really do believe in the, continu in the continuum of the Old Testament and the New Testament together. Um, uh, you know, you'll see the, 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 Bible the Bible series, bless you, a Bible series is going to be, that, that's coming on, the, the story of the crucifixion is coming on, it's going to be called part two or whatever. Yeah. You know, I, that's not the an subway, accident. I, I actually took yeah. a picture of that poster on my yeah. phone, I couldn't believe it. Right. Like, it, it was Hollywood a, and their sequels. Just short of the adventure continues. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, uh, what's Mel Brooks' great uh, joke in, in uh, Spaceballs? Uh, Spaceballs 2, the search for more money. <laughs> 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 yes, Let's have, we, we can have a couple more. Okay. We really can. I'm not in a rush. I was going to say, the, the, the depression, that, that's something I just wanted to bring up to the audience. This is, this is a, a small but important point. In talking to you, I've re, it's really made me aware of how this show, it's set in the 60s, it's very much about the 60s, but you have a sense of history as a series of cycles. I a do, series of cycles, and, I the, do and the believe depression that. might be as important in the context of this show as the 60s, I think. At the depression to, I get that is, impression. Uh, absolutely. The depression is, is, is the story of the 20th century. Uh, every single thing that happens after the Great Depression, and we'll, we'll, I mean, obviously, World War I coming into it, but everything that that generation that was formed in, in what, you, what, what is now called a recession, uh, <laughs> which is a blow to national pride, a... Um, uh, an admission that capitalism is cruel, uh, opportunity for other forms of government, radicalism, um, you know, uh, free for all, the very, the, the union being in danger, the government reaching mm -hmm. out to help people. Yeah. That was all something that they were part of. And then coming out of it in this unabashed expression of, of patriotism, which is World War II, which was not unanimous on the A side. Lots of people did not want to get involved in World War II. Don't forget that. Yeah. So, but that's not what happened when it was over. So, um, to me, that generation is formed, and the Great Depression looms in our consciousness today as the relationship between the individual and industry, food, welfare, taking care of the indigent, liberalism, all of it, conservatism, what the government's role in our life, it all stems back. But I feel like 90% of what's going on in the, in the United States right now is a war uh, between conservatives trying to undo what Roosevelt did uh, in, in, in the, to save the United States. You know, um, one, one more. Well, Are we, you done? The We're museum's done? closing, and we have to. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we two have more. To, we have to let the guards yeah. go home. So I, will you let the guards go? Well, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank Matt. Thank you very it's much, a pleasure. Matt. Absolutely. I appreciate it.